On Tech News Today, Samsung is facing further declines in profits and market share. Will a metal phone help? Plus, Samsung's virtual reality headset is revealed for the first time ever. OnePlus has one more public relations disaster on its hands, and Apple's Siri takes the stand in a murder case. Stick around. Tech News Today is next. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Wednesday, August 13th, 2014. This episode is brought to you by Personal Capital. With Personal Capital, you'll finally have all your financial life in one place and get a clear view of everything you own. Best of all, it's free. To sign up, go to personalcapital.com slash TNT. And by Gazelle, the fast and simple way to sell your used gadgets. Find out what your used iPhone, iPad, and other Apple products are worth at gazelle.com. Tech News Today is the show where we talk about the tech news with the journalists who report it. Welcome to the show. I'm surrounded by Jasons today. My name is Mike Elgin, and I think I'm the only Mike on the show, but we have at least two Jasons. Jason Howell, of course, is technical directing. We're taking over. That's Jason's right. Represent. Right, it's my always. nightmare. <laughs> Take, uh, he's technical directing with one hand, co-hosting with the other, and Jason Heiner is our guest co-anchor today. Jason is the global editor-in-chief of Tech Republic and the global long-form editor of ZDNet and Tech Republic for CBS Interactive. Welcome, Jason Heiner. Hey, thank you. Always a pleasure to be here. Always great to see you guys. Well, we're glad you're here. Now, you guys posted a long-form piece on SwiftKey that yeah. sounded pretty interesting. Can you tell us a little bit about that before we start the news? Sure, yeah. This, the title is called How SwiftKey Built the World's Smartest Keyboard and Soared to the Top of the App Economy. Um, it's a great in-depth piece uh, by Steve Ranger um, out of London. Um, SwiftKey's headquarters uh, are in London, started in London. It's a global company now. You know, now they, it's an app, right? It's an app company, um, they, but they now have 150 people working on this uh, project and on sort of the next phases of this. And so we talk about, you know, the evolution of the keyboard and why they decided to innovate in the way that they did in terms of using Swipe and using a lot of this kind of predictive intelligence. Um, pretty amazing stuff that they did. Uh, to, to build this and make the keyboard a lot smarter and more efficient. And, uh, and yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a good story. It also talks about kind of what they're doing next and the directions they want to go um, next with innovating this and, and taking it to other platforms and more users, including um, iOS coming um, this fall. iOS 8 uh, allows uh, third-party keyboards, and so they are all over it. And so, uh, so, so definitely that and their, their possibilities as well. Yeah, it's going to be huge. And I really appreciate your brand of high quality long form pieces, especially in a world of, you know, BuzzFeed type soundbite style writing. So it's really, really Thanks. welcome. And I'm looking forward to reading that one. Cool. Well, let's jump right into the news. Samsung is having a bad year. Credit rating agency Fitch Ratings yesterday predicted further decline by the company. And another analyst slashed his price target for Samsung stock, telling investors to, quote, react now before it's too late. But today, Samsung released new phones uh, made with metal rather than plastic. Roger Chang is the executive editor for CNET News and joins us now to talk about Samsung's prospects for the future. Welcome, Roger. Thanks for having me. Before we get into Samsung's uh, larger picture, can you tell us about the Samsung Galaxy Alpha line? Yeah, it's uh, it's. <clears throat> the first time that Samsung is using metal on a phone, it's um, you know answering one of the bigger complaints of Samsung's phones is that they feel kind of plasticky and cheap. Uh, and the phone is, uh, it looks really much like a, a slightly smaller version of the Galaxy S5 with a metal band around it. And the metal band actually looks uh, astonishingly similar to an iPhone. So it's got the same kind of chamfered edges with polished bevel. Um, even the, the, the kind of the, the holes at the bottom with the speakers are very reminiscent of that phone, but it's you know it's Samsung's um, first attempt at, at incorporating metal, which is something that people have asked about. So Roger, um, you know a lot. This is really kind of it has a very iPhone look-alike kind of thing. They've always Samsung right. has always had a little bit of iPhone um, envy, but this one looks even more uh, like the you know the iPhone than ever. You know how much do you think that's part of their strategy? They've taken a lot of heat for that. What, what do you think about them still going in that direction yet again? Yeah, it's it's really unusual that they would take this route and when incorporating metal for the first time and really just coming out with a phone that looks so much like the iPhone, it's it's uh, an unusual tactic. I 
you know, I talked to them. I, I contacted Samsung for a comment on that, but you know, obviously they did not want to weigh in on the issue. But yeah, you <laughs> made the point that you know Samsung has gotten a lot of criticism for you know phones that have looked similar to Apple products, and this almost seems like they're taking it up a notch. Uh, mm-hmm. But again, this is I feel like this phone is really an experiment for them. It's you know it's again the first time incorporating metal. Uh, I've talked with them over the years about the difficulties of getting metal into a smartphone, and obviously there's reception issues that come with that. And you know, it's an interesting first step. It, it you know, it may look like the iPhone, but at least it. Well, just make sure you hold it. Just make sure you don't hold it wrong. Material. Yeah, just make sure you don't hold it wrong. Right. Uh, otherwise, you won't have any reception <laughs> problems. The outside edge looks very iPhone esque. The back looks very Samsung esque. It's kind of got an upholstered yeah, it does. Uh, look to it. Uh, so that's a little different. So the metal is really around the outside edge. And one part of the explanation, Roger Chang, I think you would agree for uh, the odd introduction at this point of an iPhone. It looks like the older iPhones, actually, is the fact yep. that even for a fast mover like Samsung, it takes a while to get a phone from the design table to market. And so, you know, they probably started working on this phone a couple of years ago, possibly. Uh, we don't know the details or the timing of that, but it's not like they came up with this idea six months ago. This this takes a while to get these things out there. Now, um, Roger well, Chang, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead and you wanted to address that. Yeah, we've actually done a lot of reporting on that. Samsung's actually unusually fast when it comes to the development of new products. Like the, the original gear really came together in um, 18 months. I imagine this phone actually, it took a lot less than a couple of years to develop. I, I would imagine this phone actually took it's more in the months than years um, because Samsung has shown it can actually operate really fast when it needs to. And, you know, I think this is Samsung responding to the market. So the the company has received criticism about the materials used for its devices, its flagship devices. And um, they, they're a little cagey about whether this is a true flagship device, but um, – it's clear that they're they're experimenting with this material. And it also has to be said that Apple copied their plastic before they copied Apple's metal. <laughs> uh, sure. Apple was suddenly unapologetically plastic. Now, um, of course, sure. Samsung is squeezed in both directions. They're kind of in a pickle. They're being squeezed at the low end by Chinese handset makers like Xiaomi, Lenovo, and Huawei, and at the high end by iPhone. Um, one analyst named Mark Newman, who's with Bernstein Research, said uh, that... The company needs a, quote, drastic change in smartphone strategy, unquote. What would you advise Samsung as to what their strategy should be, Roger Chang? Well, I think Samsung is trying to be everything to everyone, and that's uh, gotten them in trouble. Uh, on, on the high end, I mean, they've obviously done a good job with the, the Galaxy S5, with the Galaxy S line, the, the Galaxy Note line. Um, it's really the problems are at the low end, as you mentioned, Xiaomi, Huawei, <laughs> Lenovo. They've lost their lead in China. They've lost their lead in India. Uh, I think uh, it's a matter of uh, creating more competitively priced phones. It's it's as simple as that. And a lot of their their investment spending is devoted towards marketing, and uh, that might have to change. They might have to change their marketing machine a little bit. Um, you know, maybe on the high end, it's it's fine, but um, you know, they they it, they tend to charge more than say the Chinese competitors uh, for a similar spec phone. So it, it is about sort of getting more competitive on the low end and. At time, and deciding whether or not they either want to sacrifice margins and can stay in the low end or, you know, be more like Apple and just ignore the low end and then stick with higher margin products. And I think that's a question that Samsung hasn't answered yet. Now, of course, the background in all this is the competitive marketplace. Traditionally, I guess traditionally being the last year or two, all of the profits, for the most part, have gone to Apple and Samsung, with Apple probably taking roughly two-thirds, Samsung taking roughly a third, and everybody else getting zilch in terms of profits. And Samsung, of course, has been declining in profits. Their uh, second quarter net profit dropped 20%, which was considered a disaster, but it's actually pretty impressive in the context of a market where nobody's making any profits except Samsung and Apple. Uh, and, of course, the big uh, looming disaster on the on the horizon is that Samsung is losing its grip on consumers across Asia. And once you lose, if you're Samsung yeah. and you lose Asia, you're, you're, you're going to be in trouble. Uh, so, um, you know, this, this is really um, a problem for them. It, uh, Roger Tang, do you have a sense of why it is that the Chinese uh, handset makers like Xiaomi, Lenovo, and Huawei – can produce uh, similarly quality phones at lower prices than Samsung. I mean, they're all manufactured in China. 
Well, I mean, that's not necessarily true. Samsung manufactures a lot of its own components and a lot of its own uh, phones. They actually have manufacturing facilities in South Korea. Uh, they do have some in China as well. But, I mean, the, the Chinese companies just run leaner and overall have lower overhead. They are, they're able to, uh, to charge lower prices. They're also more aggressive with pricing because they're, you know, they're, they're working to build share, especially overseas. They're, in Asia or in China in particular, it's, it's fairly competitive. But if you go overseas to other markets... You know, Huawei, ZTE, these companies are willing to price their products at a really low price, a little, really low rate, extremely competitive. Um, and it's something that right now Samsung hasn't been able to match. Yeah, well, I, I think uh, we're going to be watching them closely. They're going to be branching into all kinds of new areas, including, you know, Google Glass like headsets and also Oculus Rift style headsets. We're going to be talking about that story in just a minute. Interesting thing to add um, along those lines, we had we have some ZDNet reporters in um, in Korea, uh, and they um, were talking about how the Korean government is actually investing in 3D printing um, and tech companies that want to take advantage of 3D printing um, because they see uh, they see the writing in the wall that it's going to be difficult for um, for Korean companies to compete with Chinese companies in electronics. Um, so I think that you know. Interesting enough, the Koreans are kind of already seeing the right on the wall that maybe the mobile, um, that the growth in terms of future in tech is not in this area, but, you know, the next sort of phase. And they're looking at 3D printing as one of those things. Yeah, and I think um, I'm, just, I'm just looking over this. I had a crazy morning, so I wasn't able to see this before the show. So I've been kind of taking it all in. I think we've waited a long time. Like a lot of the critics, as, as has already been said, uh, have waited for the Samsung uh, metal phone if it was ever going to happen. I think it'll be interesting after all this time of people criticizing Samsung for the plastics phone, and I have to consider myself one of those people, myself included, um, to see if this ends up being a good, like a marketing success for Samsung. If, if uh, Samsung comes out of the gate with something like this, ends up doing gangbusters, then it's kind of retribution. If not, it's kind of like, hey, we, we were right all along. But it is interesting from a spec standpoint that the casing is maybe an upgrade, considered by some to be an upgrade, uh, but the internal specs are kind of mid-range. They're, they're, they're certainly not top top of the line specs at this particular moment, yeah, I don't, if that matters. I don't actually think, I mean, I'm a little skeptical on how well this, this phone will actually do. Um, the way it was announced, it was announced with very little fanfare. It was just sort of a, a, mm -hmm. a press release on its website. There was no event. There were no there was no, there was just, there wasn't any kind of celebration of this product, and it kind of shows where it sits in this lineup. I mean, it kind of, it, it's sort of given the token line that it's a flagship product, but it's it's really not when you compare to how it uh, the Galaxy S5 launched, sure. how the Galaxy Note 4 will launch next month. It, I mean, these yeah. are these are big events. Uh, the Note will launch in a three-city event. So, and, and this was a no-city event, so, yeah. or no event at all. So, it, it kind of shows you where it sits in the lineup. And I said, it, as I said in my story, it's, you know, it's less about it, the sales and more about the fact that it's uh, a potential benchmark for Samsung's progress with design. You know, it, it sort of mm -hmm. shows that they're willing to play with more, new materials, and that's that's a good thing. Yeah, We're talking great. to Roger Chang, executive editor at CNET News. Now, Roger, uh, one last question. What do you think they're going to announce at the real event next month? Uh, do you have any um, predictions? Oh, uh, yeah. As, as I said, the, the Note 4 will will be there. I imagine the... Um, Another smartwatch will be will be there as well. Um, you know, one that would possibly standalone cellular capabilities, uh, and then that the uh, the Oculus uh, virtual reality set that uh, that Chris broke yesterday. Uh, I've seen that in a, a number of other publications that's were written about over the last couple of months. Uh, I imagine that's going to show up there as well. So there's probably going to be a pretty busy, uh, packed event there. Roger Chang writes for CNET.com, and you can follow him on Twitter, Roger W. Chang, C-H-E-N-G. Thank you so much for joining us, Roger Chang. Thanks for having me. All right, we're going to talk, hey, about, we're going to talk about that uh, virtual reality headset in just a sec, but first I want to tell you about personal capital. Personal capital is going to save you a lot of money, and they're going to save your finances because right now uh, most of us don't have a really good sense of what's happening with our money. Why? Because our our, our money is put into accounts all over the internet on different sites with different passwords. And it's really difficult to feel these different parts of the elephant to really get a sense of the entire beast. But Personal Capital will show it all to you in one intuitive graph, which you can look at on your tablet, on your phone, on your laptop, and your desktop, on any sort of device you like, including your wristwatch. Personal Capital was 
one of the first companies to support Android Wear. Uh, and I've been using this app. It's really fantastic. If there's something really important happening with your money, it'll tell your wrist and your wrist will tell you. And then you'll be on top of everything. They'll save you money right away. Personal Capital also helps you save money by showing you how you're overpaying in fees for the different financial services that you're using. This is a real benefit uh, that you start to uh, take advantage of right away when you start using personal capital. There's no reason to wait because signing up takes just a minute, it pays big dividends, and, and it gives you total clarity and transparency to make better investment decisions right away. If you don't believe me, just go to the site and, and plug in your information and you'll get that that glimpse of what's happening with your money and you'll realize intuitively right away how valuable this is. So set up your free account, go to personalcapital.com slash TNT. And remember, personal capital is free and it's the smart way to grow your money. We thank personal capital for their support of tech news today. Well, in other Samsung news, the company's been rumored to be working on a virtual reality headset for some time. Rumor mongers say the product could be unveiled as early as next month. Samsung isn't talking, but The Verge's Chris Ziegler, as we talked about a minute ago, got exclusive access to a picture of the headset, which is codenamed Project Moonlight. Chris joins us now to talk about it. Welcome, Chris. Thanks for having me, Mike. So glad you're here. Now, this product is more like Google's Cardboard Project than Facebook's Oculus Rift, isn't it? That's right. Yeah, it doesn't have a display itself. It has sort of a, a, uh, a dock that you would insert your phone into, and then a lid goes over your phone. So they figure, I, I guess the logic is that since modern smartphones have such amazing and beautiful displays, why not just repurpose that? And I think that for those of us who've had a chance to try cardboard, the, the concept has certainly been validated. So, and, and they, you know, they, presumably they'd be able to sell this, uh, this kind of device for a lot less than something like a true Oculus Rift. Now, the, the, uh, the cardboard project that I talked about was something that Google unveiled at Google I.O. It was basically a piece of cardboard. They handed it to everybody who was attended the keynote. Everybody went into the outside, you know, the, the uh, area outside the conference room and started folding this thing together. And you realize that you just drop your phone in, supported most phones, you download the app, and then you see this kind of amazing uh, virtual reality kind of experience uh, this is very inexpensive. This is an open source project. Lots of other companies jumped on board and started offering them for sale right away. Uh, but this Samsung version looks to be a more sophisticated version. For example, it has focusing, apparently. Now, did you determine that, Chris, from looking at the picture, that it would have a focus feature? That's right. Yeah, the, the dial on top, of the, uh, on top of the set is reminiscent of something that you might find on, say, a set of uh, binoculars. And so I think that that's, uh, that's what they're trying to do there. You'll also notice, I didn't uh, discuss this in the article uh, in, in great depth, but you'll notice that on the left side, there appears to be uh, what might be a micro USB port. And I think that, um, I, I don't know if there's a battery in, in the, the goggles. I don't know what that's going to be used for, but there's obviously some sort of connectivity between the phone and the goggles. So, so Chris, how long do you expect the you know, product to be before this is going to come to, uh, you know, come to fruition? Looks like we have a bit of a Skype issue with Jason. Go ahead. Can you repeat that, Jason? I think we had Sorry. a little Skype glitch. Yeah, yeah. I was just asking Chris, you know, what was his expectation? Do you think they're going to, are they going to release this this fall? Is this more of a 2015 thing? What are you, what are you thinking on release date? Well, given uh, what Samsung is want to do at its uh, unpacked events, and certainly with devices like the Note 4, which presumably we'll see at this event, um, yeah. I, I would expect this to be released pretty rapidly. Um, I don't know what their go-to-market strategy is going to be. I don't know if it'll be sold in carrier stores. I don't know if it'll be sold through places like Amazon. I don't know if it'll be bundled with the Note 4. Um, I think that all of those options are on the table. But I would certainly expect, given what with Samsung's typical strategy, I would certainly expect to see this uh, on store shelves in 2014. Speaking of Samsung's typical strategy, when they announced their smartwatches, uh, their initial rollout of smartwatches, they disappointed a lot of us, including those of us with Moto Xs, that their smartwatches would support only certain models of Samsung-specific phones. Are they going to make that mistake again here? Is this, uh, is this virtual reality thing going to support Samsung phones only? Well, I think um, when you look at how this device is put together, I don't really know how they could make it universal. I think that they could try, but it would be a compromise. Um, I, I, my suspicion is that they might have different lids that secure different Samsung phones in place, but I just don't see this being a, a universal set of goggles. And to be fair, considering Samsung's market share here, I think it's something that they can get away with 
a little bit better than, say, an HTC or a Sony. Um, Chris, you know, one of the things that we've heard that uh, Facebook is trying to do is they're trying to find what are the other ways they could do with this technology beyond just sort of gaming. The gaming implications are obvious, but, you know, are, are there other applications that they could do? Um, yet any sense that, that Samsung's thinking that way, that they're thinking of this as a sort of a larger play and that they might be able to do something, um, you, you know, something bigger with this beyond just some gaming? Right. Well, Jason, you know, you know as well as I do that, Samsung has a tendency to uh, throw stuff at the wall and see what sticks. Uh, and I, I think I think that uh, that these goggles could certainly be an example of that. I think I mean gaming has to be part of this, right? In fact, in the, the picture we posted, uh, they have um, I can't remember the name of it, but Samsung's gaming pad is in that picture. So I think that that there will yeah. certainly be some sort of gaming component. Uh, but you can imagine how uh, content providers Sam, Samsung has enough market push so that they could probably talk content providers into uh, providing uh, some sort of 3D world type content for this. I don't know if that would be in the form of a, a movie or shows or something that that is uh, something that's custom fitted for these goggles. Uh, I don't think that's off the table. Um, so yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised to see, of course, you know, Samsung has a number of different platforms and it's stable. They have things like Milk. Um, so you could see how they could sort of incorporate this in a seamless way as long as they could get content providers on board. Yeah, cool. I'm thinking of the ways, you know, the, thinking of the things like um, these sort of high teleconferencing for uh, certain professions and that, you know, somebody like deep mm -hmm. sea diving or exploring a cave or exploring a building that might be um, in danger or that, right? And being able to, you know, you have two pairs of these, you have one person with it. And I guess one person even, um, uh, you know, that could be, sort of helping the person that's in that situation or, you know, those kinds of things. There, there's, there, there are some really interesting real world applications for these kinds of things. So it'll be interesting to see if they go in that direction. Yeah, absolutely. One of those interesting applications would be the controlling of a, uh, dr a camera based drone. Uh, I was talking yesterday, we had a gentleman in here who was uh, visiting uh, the, the brick house and uh, we were talking about his uh, various passions, one of which is drone photography. He's got one of these $1,300 drones and, and he was talking about how, you know, the, the only way to really learn how to fry, uh, fly it is to forget about what you see with your actual naked eye and focus on what the drone sees through the picture that's provided on your tablet or your phone. And, of course, something like this. This is the uh, cardboard product they gave out at Google I.O. So to be able to look through and see what a drone sees, especially if they have binocular vision in drones, that would be really, really cool. Um, yeah. But, again, I just, I, it just has to be said, I think, for those of you who haven't tried the cardboard, and are wondering about this category, I personally think that this is a brilliant category for Samsung and for other companies as well. The idea of using a smartphone as the computer, the screen, and all of the electronics, or most of the electronics, uh, for virtual reality is brilliant because it's low cost, making it affordable for lots of people. It makes tons of sense. Everybody's got a smartphone. The app ecosystem exists and is uh, fully functional. And it's one of those things that once you try it, it's one of those rare experiences that when you try it, you're like, oh, I really get this. This has really got a bright future for sure. Like this, this form factor is really going to take off. And it'll be, it'll be interesting to see who else comes out with a device like this and how Samsung uh, evolves their device. Knowing Samsung, they'll probably come out with five versions of it or something. But uh, <laughs> regardless of the specifics, it's an awesome category. It's a low-cost category, and I'm really excited to see what people are going to do with VR with smartphones. I, I really love it. Um, do you have any other comments before uh, we close this segment, Chris? Well, I do think it's interesting that uh, Oculus is rumored to be involved with this project, and that's a, that's a rumor that uh, dates back, I believe, to May of this year. Um, and so you can see how... Oculus, even potentially under Facebook's control, is trying to push not just its own hardware, but an entire ecosystem. And if they can be involved in the software layer in this in this product, product I think it's a big win for them and a big win for the VR eco ecosystem overall. Chris Ziegler writes at TheVerge.com, and you can follow him on Twitter at ZPower. ZPower, you've got ZPower, man. That's a great Twitter <laughs> handle. Thank you so Thank much you. for joining us, Chris Ziegler. Thanks, Thanks Chris. OnePlus, a new smartphone company launched recently in China, once again finds itself with another marketing disaster on its hands. The company yesterday launched a contest called Ladies First, in which women were invited to upload pictures of themselves with a OnePlus logo written on their skin or on a card. The winners were to be judged by OnePlus staff, and 50 or so would be invited to the front of the line for OnePlus One smartphone invitations, plus get a free T-shirt.
The contest was immediately labeled as sexist and offensive. The company canceled the promotion, removed all mention of it on their site, and apologized, throwing rogue employees under the bus for the error. Jason Heiner, they've done it again. I think this is the third or the fourth big marketing blunder. Uh, you know, they're batting, batting a thousand in terms of messing up with their marketing. Um, yeah, what a train wreck. Um, <laughs> you know, I think that this is one of those things, like I think somebody thought they had the right intentions um, here of, um, you know, women are really important smartphone um, uh, users. And in many cases, I, there's, you know, data that shows, you know, women use their smartphones more, they um, are, they use more apps, they use, uh, you know, they're very important part of the market. And so I think somebody thought they were being clever and, and with this, but at the end, it's extremely, you know, um, uh, just uh, insensitive and, you know, it is sexist. And it's so, so let's do a, a contest, you know, objectifying women in sort of some of the worst stereotypical ways. And uh, yeah, what a train wreck, what a train wreck. I don't know. This is one of those things that, you know, when you do have small companies that are just getting started, um, you, you can get to market fast with certain things and you can move quickly, but sometimes moving quickly um, can work against you as much as it can help you. And this is one of those cases where moving quickly, you know, this didn't necessarily get vetted uh, as well as it should have. And, and they've really done um, a lot of damage, I think, to their brand by doing this. I, I would guess that, that what they really need is some women uh, who are involved in marketing. Absolutely. Uh, and and uh, yeah. that might have helped a lot. Um, and of course, you know, essentially this is ladies night, you know what I That's mean? That's exactly They're, what it is. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. so Jason, yep. I think you, before we get into the, I, I wanted to review their past blunders and just sort of ponder what it is yeah. about this company that causes, causes them problems. Um, but, but, uh, uh so I know Jason Howell, you've re reviewed the, the phone. Jason yeah. Heiner, have you reviewed the phone as well? I haven't reviewed the phone. Okay, no. so Jason, what do you think about this phone? I mean, this is a great phone for the price, right? Oh, I mean, it's, yes, absolutely, undoubtedly a fantastic device, uh, excellent hardware. All in all, like, I was super impressed with the hardware and, and my experience with the device. Leo has it right now, and he loves it. Um, it's, it's such a, oh, man, it's such a tricky place to be in, right, because... Not it's not very often that great hardware comes out uh, out of nowhere, seemingly because OnePlus is a pretty new company and they're doing a lot yeah. of good things here. Uh, but Jason, I completely agree with you. I I don't feel like there's a lot of people that are kind of wondering if maybe this is just brilliant marketing and that they meant to to you know tick as many people off with this this project because uh, it's it's going to get people talking about it. I don't think that it was intentional necessarily. I do think yeah. that a new company that has so much going for it has so much to lose uh, from mistakes like this and yeah they need somebody in marketing that can like they have good beginnings of ideas maybe uh, and they certainly know how to get people talking about their product the problem is uh it could do long-term damage to such a new company and yeah i don't know i, I feel it, it's awkward because i love the device but now i feel like there's an asterisk at least repeatedly the the company culture is proving that they don't think these things through. And that's a hard thing to recommend. Let's review some of the, the blunders they've made. When the company was launched, they presented themselves as, uh, as uh, what is his name? Lau, I believe his name was, the, the, the CEO of it. Um, basically, uh, he was a guy at Oppo. How do, is that how you pronounce that, Jason? Oppo or Oppo? I think it's Oppo. I, okay, let's go. Let's knows? go with Oppo. Who knows? <laughs> uh, but Pete Lau. His name is his name is Pete Lau, and and the story was that he, you know, he's w at this uh, larger company Oppo uh, in China, and decided he wanted to strike out on his own and create a whole new company, just zero based the whole problem of smartphones, the price of smartphones, the quality of smartphones, and create an entirely new device that nobody had ever seen before, completely innovative, you know, young genius startup and so on. And then it emerged around April or so that, in fact, the company is owned by Oppo. And <laughs> and not, it, that emerged in, in two places. First is it turned out that uh, the, their uh, domains were registered by Oppo. And then it turned out that the sole owner of the company was Oppo. Then the company came out and said, oh, well, it's not, we're not owned by the competitor, the other company that makes phones, not that Oppo. There's another Oppo that is an investment company, and that investment company inv invests in both us, plus, uh, OnePlus, and also Oppo. Uh, that, is, um, that may be true, but it doesn't appear to be true from my own research. If you look, if you search for uh, Google for Oppo Electronic, which is supposed to be the investment company, 
Oppo Electronic shows a knowledge base card that takes you to Oppo, the company that makes smartphones, which they just call themselves Oppo. And the Wikipedia page for Oppo Electronics says that that's the name of the company. But if you uh, if you take the Chinese company and 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 um, give the literal translation, the literal translation of the company is Guangdong Oppo Mobile Communications. Now, Oppo Mobile is being presented as the company that makes smartphones. I couldn't find any evidence at all that there are two companies named Oppo. There seems to be one company. So I could be wrong about that. There's just there there just doesn't seem to be any evidence online that that is true. But even if it's not true, they they got people excited that they were this innovative new startup, mm -hmm. and then they kind of disappointed their best users. Uh, when they found out, oh, this is this is just Oppo. Now, further exacerbating the problem is that reviewers have pointed out that the OnePlus One looks and feels and is spec almost exactly like the Oppo, uh, like one of the uh, Oppo flagship phones, uh, and it could very much uh, the Oppo Find Seven. So, if you compare those uh, head to head, yes, there are differences, but it seems like the uh, the, the OnePlus One is just another phone in the uh, in the Find line. It's not radically different. It's not shaped radically different. The camera's the same. The you know a lot of the things that were considered innovative about the uh, OnePlus One are you know it's just basically in the in the um, in the same line as the uh, Find Seven. So that seemed like another letdown. And then finally, they had their first. Uh, official marketing blunder was when they announced a contest called Smash the Past. They basically announced that we're going to give away 100 in, uh, phones. You're gonna, we're going to charge you $1. You get to the front of the line. You get one of the first people to get one of these uh, phones that nobody else can get. Um, all you have to do is smash your old phone into smithereens and post the video <laughs> or the pictures or whatever online. People misunderstood that, and some people started smashing their phones preemptively uh, and that's not how the contest worked. And so people ended up with no phone. They had they smashed their old phone, and then they didn't get a new phone. That was problematic. And then environmentalists jumped in, and other people jumped in, saying this is dangerous, this is wasteful, and it's bad for the yeah. environment because when you smash a when you smash a phone, toxic chemicals go into the environment. You know, it, it's just it was a it was it a, can't be reused exactly. And <laughs> yeah. and they ba backtracked on that one. So yeah. they've they've done two major marketing pushes, and both of them they had to backtrack and apologize. It's a disaster. Both Complete train wrecks. Yeah. Um, I, I've heard a lot of people say good things about the phone, just like Jason um, Howell is saying as well. Um, so it, it is kind of a bummer, like like he's saying, because I actually think they, they are, you know, maybe on the right track in terms of where they want to be going with product development. Um, but man, it's tough to make a first impression and it's tough when your first impression and your second impression are both, you know, um, really tough. So uh, it'll be interesting to see. I think ultimately, you know, the market, there is still a place in the market for a, a phone that is, um, you know, unlocked and that you, you know, can buy separate from the carriers and that has, you know, really great specs. And, um, you know, maybe they'll, maybe they'll still be able to, um, to do it, but they do have a little bit of an uphill battle ahead of themselves now from a brand perspective. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, I, my advice to, to OnePlus is just sell the phone and point out the fact that it's by far the best phone for under 300 bucks. Right. That's all that needs to be done. That's exactly. All you need to do. At totally. this point, this phone would sell itself. It was just available. It makes you wonder if there's a supply issue or what the reason is that it's still not available because they have, they have a, a home run. They just need to release it. Unfortunately, things like this uh, put them on third and second and then first and <laughs> then they strike out. I don't know. I, it's a horrible <laughs> baseball analogy. <laughs> well, anyway, um, good luck to them. Uh, uh, they say third time's the, the, the charm. So hopefully their next big marketing effort will have a little bit more uh, savvy so. behind it. Yeah. Well, Twitter rolled out a new beta product today called Promoted Video. The new ad format will charge advertisers on a cost per view basis. Jason Heiner, are you concerned about what they're doing to Twitter? I mean, they're kind of turning it into Facebook. And the thing that I think a lot of people love about Twitter is it doesn't have all these bells and whistles and videos and all this kind of stuff. Is this a mistake or is this a good business decision? Yeah, boy, this is a tough one because Twitter really is, you know, it's a feed and and the feed is the, the power of it. And the more, you know, I, I already get a little bit annoyed by the images um, in there and the videos that are, you know, that are that are in the feed. And it's sort of the quickest way I end up unfollowing somebody is if they're posting, you know, multimedia all the time and clogging up my feed. So, um, but, you know, I mean, these guys obviously are the, the management that's running Twitter today you know they're in the 
Um, they're in the uh, the phase where they've got to monetize this thing and they're trying a lot of different things. I don't know if this is the answer. I mean, I think ultimately, um, I know people that have done marketing campaigns with Twitter, promoted tweets and those kind of things, and they say they're actually getting pretty good results um, from that stuff. And so I think that they would be better off um, investing in analytics, um, better analytics, um, premium products for for uh, companies that want to manage, you know, their brands. Um, there's so many, they, they have such a marketing engine. Um, so many companies have a marketing engine around social media now. I think they they could do a lot better by, you know, trying to monetize, uh, you know, the, all the, the businesses that want to do business and brands that want to do business uh, on Twitter, give them better tools, um, give them, you know, better analytics, give them ways to, you know, do a lot of the things that they end up doing with third party tools um, on Twitter, have a Twitter pro version that, you know, is is really great that does some of the things like Bitly does with analytics and those kind of things. I, I just, you know, I, I think they could make more money and, and preserve their brand and preserve the user experience by going in that direction rather than like doing stuff like this, which is ultimately user hostile. And when you, you start monetizing in ways that are user hostile, you know, you, you start um, mortgaging the future of your brand. And it's a slippery slope once you roll out these videos uh, you'll start rolling out automatically playing videos and then you're going to have yeah. videos, you're going to have ads in front of other users' videos. And, you know, it's it just, they're, the way that advertising works is that they just keep turning it up, turning it up, turning it up. And that's fine for a lot of places. I mean, people are used to visual clutter on Facebook. People are used to visual clutter on the web proper, but they're not used to visual clutter on Twitter. And, yeah. you know, for some people, the solution is a third party uh, Twitter uh, client uh, that that can uh, help a lot, and of course, it also has to be said that this product, this this beta product that that we're talking about, promoted video, is going to be very welcome to some advertisers. I mean, there's a bike maker named Specialized who told Adweek that videos doubled their engagement compared to branded tweets. And so I don't know if that's a universal among, uh, you know, people who have been testing this, and we don't know how many people are testing it. Uh, and we don't know when it'll be available to the general public, but it's probably a reasonable bet that it's uh, going to pay off for advertisers. Now, be, uh, there's a caveat that comes with that. Sometimes when you have a new product and you're one of the few videos, then it's far more powerful than when people start feeling... Uh, besieged by videos and they, their eyes glaze over and scar tissue forms and people stop uh, clicking on them. And so that it could turn out uh, in the end to be uh, sort of a wash for them. Yeah. Yeah, it could. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll keep an eye on uh, where Twitter goes. This is a part of an ongoing series, I guess you could call it, uh, for Twitter sort of tweaking and, and sort of evolving away from the minimalist text-based uh, service that we all fell in love with uh, back in uh, 2006, 2007. Well, a scandal has emerged in South Korea after footage was broadcast by a Korean TV station showing women being harassed on the street and pressured into coming inside wireless carrier stores for an aggressive sales pitch. The video shows in one case a salesman grabbing a woman's phone and refusing to give it back until she comes into the store. In other cases, salespeople physically grab the hands of some women and literally pull them inside. And, and uh, I've seen other footage where two or three salespeople essentially uh, kind of corral uh, a, a woman who's by herself and kind of almost push her into the store. This is, this is horrible. And, of course, they're just singling out women. No, no men are being approached uh, on the street. This, this is a really bad uh, case, but it kind of reminds me of a larger trend, Jason Heiner. And I think um, maybe I'm just uh, overreacting to this, but it reminds me of the Comcast story where competition has gone to all the legitimate places it can, and now it's starting to go illegit. So to, in order to compete, uh, it, companies are just deciding, you know what, let's just go ahead and abuse people. Let's be creepy. I mean, this one is so creepy. I just, uh, yeah, this video is just... And, and, and then combined with the story, the one plus one story earlier, it's like, man, it's, uh, you know, hostile to women um, uh, day in, in tech news, which is which is uh, sad. Um, yeah, this is so over the top and inappropriate and in that a company it, it either, you know, encourages this or, or looks the other way. It's just completely unacceptable. And, you know, I hope that. Um, yeah, I hope that they feel repercussions for it, and I hope that they stop it as soon as possible. The good news is that we have the Internet, 
Thank you, Internet, True. because it Thank enables you. us to name and shame the Comcasts and the uh, Korean uh, wireless carriers uh, when they do this kind of stuff. And we can all uh, point and ridicule and criticize and cancel our, our subscriptions and, and, get and, them to and change so on. Your behavior. And so that's a good thing. And, and so that's something that didn't used to exist in all kinds of uh, aggressive practices like this have existed for decades, maybe even centuries. Who knows? But sure. there weren't cameras around and, and microphones around to record it all and then a global internet to, to share it. So uh, so that is here, here. the good news. And of course, I think that, of course, they'll be stopping this immediately because now everybody's going to be looking for this sort of thing. Well, in a sec, we're going to talk about some follow-ups, but first I want to tell you about Gazelle. Gazelle is going to buy your used gadget. Why? Because it's a great deal and it's super easy to do. You got If you had... A couple hundred bucks lying around in a drawer. Would you just leave it there for months and years? No, you would pull it out and you would put it in your wallet and you'd go spend it and buy something you really want. Well, that's essentially what's happening uh, with your old gadget. You've got these old devices lying around. It's just money in electronic form. Gazelle wants to buy them. And the sooner you sell it to Gazelle, the more money they're going to give it, give you for it. Just go to gazelle.com. That's G-A-Z-E-L-L-E.com. Find the device you'd like to sell. Tell Gazelle the condition. Sometimes they'll even buy broken iPhones and iPads, by the way. And they'll quote you a price. That price is locked in, so you can be assured that that is the price they are going to pay you. They'll send you a box in most cases. You pull the sticker out of the box, put your phone in the box, put the sticker on the box, and off it goes, and they pay you fast by check, PayPal, or an additional 5% if you choose the Amazon gift card option. That's the one I always choose because... That's just more money, and it's better. Uh, Gazelle's paid nearly $170 million to more than a million customers. Shipping is free, processing is fast, and there are no listing hassles. So find out what your iPhone is worth. Take a minute. Go to gazelle.com and find out. you got to try Gazelle. We told you last month uh, about Mark Gurman's report on 9to5Mac that Amazon was getting ready to launch its own Square-like mobile card, uh, credit card reading hardware product. Well, today Amazon unveiled it. It's a $10 credit card scanning device called Amazon Local Register. The scanner is for brick-and-mortar businesses only. Amazon will compete by charging less. Square and PayPal charge 2.7% on all transactions, but Amazon will charge 2.5%. And for merchants who sign up before October 31st, the rate will be 1.7%. 5%. Boy, Jason Heiner, Amazon is good at uh, undercutting everybody on price, aren't they? Yeah, you know, Jeff Bezos has that great quote of like, my um, competitor's margin is my opportunity. Um, and that is exactly how they approach everything. They just look in, um, at markets and they look and see, okay, what's the margin that, that competitors are making and how can we go in and can we build a business around making less margin and you know stealing market share and uh, and and you know win on volume? And um, man, they're really good at it. They are they are ex insanely good at it. And this yep. is just another. It's really interesting that an online retailer like Amazon, you know, essentially the on uh, online retailer, poster yeah. child for on online retail, is so intent on going after brick and mortar business. I think that the Amazon Fire Phone is very much a showrooming device. It's to a very mm -hmm. large extent optimized for walking into a brick and mortar store, finding the product you want in their inventory, and then buying it on Amazon, walking out and leaving the store with nothing other than a rent or a lease bill to pay and uh, nothing to show for it. So, you know, it's really interesting that they're going after brick and mortar now with with, with this uh, Square and PayPal competitor. Yeah, you know, and, and I guess in one sense, this, you could also look at it as this is a way to help, this could help brick and mortar. I mean, if they're paying larger, or if they're paying lower fees, um, and, uh, you know, that kind of thing, maybe in some cases it helps them. I mean, it certainly could help, um, you know, it, it, it could help the, the sort of smaller merchants where, you know, your margins are naturally, their margins are, are naturally every, every percent or, you know, tenth of a percent counts. Um, so, you know, Amazon, it's a really interesting game they're playing where they are certainly attacking local realtor, realtor or uh, local retailers in many cases. Um, but something like this, you know, could also uh, have the effect of, of, I don't know, benefiting them um, in, sure. in that sense. What do you think? Well, I think that, that uh, one of the underappreciated factors is one that Amazon is very well aware of, which is that people, almost all of us, buy certain types of things from Amazon 
and other th types of things we never buy from Amazon. Yes, huge, long, major categories of, of devices, and that's why they've experimented with uh, a program, for example, where they'll give you a flat uh, delivery fee for the weight of a box, and they're trying to get you to buy paper towels and things like that that you'd normally buy at Costco uh, from Amazon, saying, hey, it's no big deal. We'll deliver it just like everything else. But still, the problem remains that they don't know what people are buying when they don't buy on Amazon, and this is a way for them to find out what you're really interested in. Let's say, for example, Jason Heiner, let's say you were a, a big cigar smoker. I know you're not. You're, you're a, a <laughs> very healthy person. But let's say you, you were a big cigar smoker and you were buying cigars all the time and you went in and you were using the Amazon card swiper to buy cigars. Well, now they know you like cigars. So maybe they want to yeah, start right? giving you ads for lighters and cigar cutters and cigars and all kinds of other things. And they, they can also extrapolate what types of products that cigar smokers like that are not cigar related. Maybe you, they're going to advertise scotch at you. And, you know, it goes on books about cigars. I mean, it, it's really valuable to them as an advertising vehicle. And I think this is a very underappreciated aspect to the story. Oh, yeah. No, you're exactly right, Mike. I mean, you know, I think we've talked about it before and it's been said many times before. Big data is the new oil, right? I mean, this is a big data play. They're going to get more data on more customers um, and on more sort of transactions. And the more data that they get, the better um, the chance that they're going to win in the future. Um, I think, you know, I think you're right on the money. Um, I think that they will also, um, the, the potential is they could use that against those retailers. And so, you know, that gets at sort of where you were starting in the beginning is, you know, that they, they have it in for brick and mortar, you know, in, in many ways. And that's a way where, you know, they may, give, they may save you a few dollars now um, or they may even save you a few thousand dollars now. Um, but in the end, uh, if they learn more about your customers and they have better mechanisms for understanding that data and cross-referencing that data with other data sources, um, then they can take those customers uh, in the future, right? So that's pretty powerful stuff. Amazon, love them or hate them, they are disciplined and they are smart. And this is another example of that. Well, we reported yesterday that Uber employees were resorting to dirty tricks, ordering then canceling more than 5,000 rides from their rival Lyft. Well, now the New York Times says Lyft employees have done the same thing to Uber drivers, but nearly 13,000 times. So dirty tricks are going in both directions. In, in both cases, there isn't any evidence that this is company policy. It could be just the, uh, the, the sort of initiative of the individual drivers who are trying to drum up more business for themselves. Well, in other news, Apple's Siri has been interrogated by the police, and it's singing like a canary. A Florida man named Pedro Bravo is on trial for killing his roommate. It's a tragic, tragic story, but it has a fascinating tech angle. It turns out the police were able to review his iPhone Siri usage, uh, looking at the history of what, how he used it, and discovered that he told Siri on the night of the murder, quote, I need to hide my roommate, unquote. Now, Siri, the most interesting aspect is Siri's response. Siri responded with, what kind of place are you looking for? And then offered four options, swamps reservoirs, metal foundries, or dumps. The phone gave up other evidence, too. The flashlight feature was used nine times just before midnight on the night of the murder. Wow. Uh, Jason Heiner, um, who done it? You know, ask your iPhone. This is incredible. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. It's the world we live in, you know, connected world. I love there it. Is. Yeah, I love there the fact is. that he specified his roommate in the query. I mean, why would Siri care who, you know, I mean, it, it's just, the whole thing is just uh, absolutely hilarious. And, you know, I think Siri has that answer in there, by the way, as a joke. I mean, you know, people are always asking Siri goofy things and Apple tries to put in uh, humorous answers. And I think this was programmed in there as, an, as a humorous answer to the question, how, how do I get rid of a body? Uh, but uh, I don't think they anticipated the fact that an actual uh, accused murderer might actually use that uh, feature. Do it. Oh, man. Well, I wonder which of the four options he chose. Well, uh, our TNT fan of the day is Cheryl Bohannon in the American state of Kentucky, who posted this picture on Twitter of herself listening to the show while mowing bluegrass, presumably, on this colossal riding lawnmower. Uh, Jason Howell and Jason Heiner, man, we got to get one of these for Twit. This is a that, look at that lawnmower. <laughs> Go Kentucky. That's fantastic. I, I'm, Tech Republic's headquarters are in Louisville, Kentucky. So really? uh, one of my neighbors. <laughs> That's awesome. Sort of. That's awesome. I mean, that is just, look at that thing. That's that, a beast. That is very impressive. Very impressive. Agreed. You could tow a boat with that thing. Well, anyway, I want one. <laughs> um, so how do you watch or listen to TNT? Just take a picture of yourself, post it on Google+, Twitter, or Facebook using the hashtag 
How do you watch TNT? And we will find it. Jason Heiner, that is the tech news today. Um, so tell us um, what uh, where people can find your work and also the work of the people that you work with to create these long form stories. Yeah, great. So um, on techrepublic.com, um, we publish, as you said, uh, regularly publish uh, a series of long form um, articles now. We, have, we had one um, two weeks ago on uh, biotech. Uh, we had a really great story um, on a new uh, bioprinter, uh, 3D bioprinter that was that was uh, launched. And this is one that's sort of going to change the face of healthcare um, in the uh, in, in the decades, really in the years and decades to come. Um, so that was our most recent one before we launched the one on SwiftKey, the inside story of SwiftKey today. But we've written about lots. We've written about 3D printing. We've written about Google Fiber, um, the inside story of that and kind of where they're going next with that. Uh, and so we, we do these, you know, every um, one to two weeks, we publish one of these really in-depth uh, long form stories. And then we also do uh, our stuff that we do every day um, in terms of um, tips and uh, best practices and advice for uh, technology decision makers um, all across the economy and all different sectors and, and that kind of thing. And then over on ZDNet, you know, obviously we cover a lot of business tech news as well. And, uh, and we do a monthly kind of roundup feature of uh, a set of features um, on, a, on a special topic. So August, our, our uh, topic for August was 3D printing. Uh, and so we have a, a great collection over there uh, on ZDNet of um, sort of what uh, people need to know about the future of 3D printing and how it can, you know, transform their business and, and transform, you know, their plans for the future and uh, a lot of good stuff around that as well. I imagine Jason Howell could use one of those bio 3D printers to grow another arm uh, for uh, <laughs> use in doing the show. I, I can I think put it to really use, handy. yes, please. Yeah. Definitely. At least one Definitely. more arm. Well, Jason Heiner, thank you so much for joining us as our guest co-anchor today on Tech News Today. A pleasure. Great seeing you guys. Great to see you too. We want you to subscribe to Tech News Today. It's a really convenient way to get the show. Just go to Stitcher, iTunes, YouTube, Feedly, Yahoo, RSS, or other locations, or you can simply just go to twit.tv slash TNT and choose your option or choose two options. Follow us on Twitter at Tech News Today TV. That's our Twitter name. And let us know what's on your mind via email at TNT at twit.tv or voicemail at 260-TNT-SHOW. Don't miss our evening newscast, Tech News Tonight at 4 p.m. Pacific tonight and every weeknight right here on the Twit Network. My name's Mike Elgin. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you tomorrow.